So the year is 1973 and tensions are high. The Vietnam War ended without basically a victory, at least for, you know, America. The vice president had resigned in disgrace. The president was involved in a scandal and was heading towards impeachment. There was war in the Middle East between Israel and Egypt, and Middle Eastern oil producing companies had placed an embargo on the U.S., causing gas prices to soar. U.S.-Soviet Union relations were so bad that we were on the brink of nuclear war with the U.S. military on DEFCON 3 alert for the first time since the Cuban Missile Crisis. It was bad. There was a lot of stuff going down. And in the middle of all this, what most people don't realize is that UFOs with humanoid occupants were being seen all over the world at a crazy rate in 1973. Uh, And most of this activity happened in October, but I mean, it was just crazy, this, this huge volume of UFO sightings and, and encounters with, with extraterrestrial beings, some of which we've even talked about already on the show, and we'll get to that later. But I thought, you know, based on, well, this started when I found a story from Columbia from 1973, and when mm-hmm. I looked into it a little more, I learned that there's this entire wave of UFO sightings that happened that year. And so we're going to talk about the 1973 UFO wave. From a child born into this world, we are taught what to believe. Close-minded, we become fearful to be deceived. Still, we desire to know what lies beyond that locked door. The art of the storyteller, conjuring tales of legend and lore. History hidden, lost knowledge, things forgotten and the unknown. These are the things that direct us and will set the tone. Welcome, friends, to another episode of Nightmares on the Lost Highway. UFO encounters are nothing new from present day back to the 1973 that we're going to be talking about tonight. Well, and and before that even. So. Oh, yeah. Egyptian time frame. But to the fabulous 1940s UFO events, you know, that had Roswell, New Mexico, the UFO crash, which was, of course, as we've talked about later, changed to nothing more than a weather balloon. Uh, but as I said, all the way back to the time of ancient Egypt. But as Bill had already talked upon, there was just so much going on in the world of especially pol- you know, politics. Uh, to just set the pace, I just did some bullet points here. These, any one of these things is enough, but these are all bullet points of all things going on in 1973. Monday, February 12th, first American prisoners of the Vietnam War are released back to the U.S. Thursday, February 22nd, President Richard Nixon visits China. The United States and the People's Republic of China agree to establish this liaison uh, sites and start working together. Number three was Tuesday, February 27th. We haven't even left February yet, guys. The American Indian Movement occupies Wounded Knee, South Dakota. That's going to continue to build up through 1973. Still in February, February 29th, the last of the American soldiers depart from Vietnam. Number five, we jump to April 6th. Uh, This was the launch of the Pioneer 11 spacecraft rocket, which, uh, you know, launches this basically right into that great space race that I mentioned. Number six, Monday, April 3rd, now we're still in April, President Nixon announces several top White House staff members have resigned due to the whole Watergate scandal. Uh, We jump to May 8th, Tuesday, a 71-day standoff between American Indian movements and federal agents end at Wounded Knee in South Dakota. Monday, May 14th, Skylab, America's first space station, is launched, and it's the very last launch of the Saturn V space rocket. Number nine, Thursday, May 17th, the Watergate scandal hearings begin with the U.S. Senate and are televised nationally. This was a thing of, you know, basically unheard of at this time. We're bringing all of this that's going on right to your televisions, to people's homes. Tuesday, June 26th, 1973, media reports that nine people have died due to an explosion in Russia involving the Cosmos 3M rocket. Number 11, July 16th, former U.S. aide Robert uh, Butterfield declares to the U.S. Senate hearing that President Nixon personally recorded potential confidential secrets. And we'll wrap up with number 12, taking us just to September 26th. The Concorde plane makes its first ever nonstop journey across the Atlantic in record-breaking time. That's just a few of the major headline events of everything that's going on in 1973. 
Oh my gosh. And with all these news making events going on, you have a wave of UFO sightings around the world unfolding. Yes, around the world. Most of them happening in October. 36 out of the 55 sightings in the United States between August and December happened in October. Seven sightings took place on the 17th alone, two on the night of the 16th, and three on the night of the 15th. Was I it mean, we had so much stuff going on, the aliens were just like, hey, it's like a drive-in movie theater. We got to go check this stuff out. <laughs> or were we, you know, subterfuge and deflection? Was it the idea that- Not like oh, that's ever happened. We, we got other things we want people looking at instead of yeah, all these- Look over here, look over here. things. You know, and in most of the sightings in, throughout 1973 could be divided into two categories. Those that were human sightings, which were encounters with aliens and human-like beings. And then they had what they called anthropoid sightings, which were encounters with aliens, which were much more Bigfoot-like in description. Now, as I went through and cataloged the the encounters I wanted to talk about, I left out anything that was not a UFO or some sort of alien interaction that was obviously an alien. I did. Similar. I did find a lot of stories about creature encounters, just weird or other stuff. One that was like almost a ghost type thing in the woods, and it was like, well, there's no association there. So. To be fair, I left out probably half of what I came across, and I do want to give a lot of credit to the website UFOinsight.com. Um, never really stumbled upon them before, but they are a treasure trove of UFO information. They had a huge article on the 1973 wave, and then within it, it had links to almost each individual thing. Oh, wow. and I'm talking whole page descriptions of like each encounter. Wow. So it was a very, very good resource and and probably most of what I'm going to talk about, I at least found there and then, you know, expanded upon it later on. I've got the first sighting I came across was January 2nd, two days into the first of the year. Well, I don't have one until February, so you you beat me by a few days. All right. Well, let me jump in. Uh, January 2nd, 1973. This is in Santa Ana, California. Uh, At least eight witnesses observed this large oval shaped object with a dome on the very top, seemingly to hover over the county. Now, at times, stating this strange UFO was hovering about 200 feet above the ground, but would change altitudes, change directions for just about seven seconds total time, and then just spinning off at great speeds and just vanished. So that right. happened a lot. Yeah. Just, they, they take off and just dis- or they just Oh my disappear. gosh, they're looking at us. We need to throw Basically, it Mach yeah. 3. <laughs> I have a lot of stories that have that, so. And then I have one uh, January and February of 1973 in Cherokee, South Carolina. Police stations were so inundated with calls of reports, they simply could not keep up. And so they just quit sending out officers to investigate these sightings. There were literally hundreds of sightings out of various shapes. I thought this was really cool because you have all the different, I guess, traditional shapes. You have the, the cylindrical. You have the round with the dome. I mean, kind of the, the cartoon image of the Jetsons. Oh, yeah. you, every you know, one UFO of these encounters of is like a different shaped UFO, different types of aliens. I mean. We got cigar shaped here. We have the triangle shaped. I mean, so we're checking all the boxes. They're in Cherokee, South Carolina. They're spotting all of these within just a, a two months of each other. By the end of February, the UFO phenomenon had become so common and so popular that sky watching along the side of the roadsides where you just pull your car out, take the family, pull off to the side and get out and sky watch. You'd set on the hood, set on the trunk and just, you know, maybe have some early cameras, uh, telescopes, binoculars, whatever. They said that it was very common for any of the major roles. Uh, like in one weekend, they said there was over 50 cars that were reported on one major highway alone, just pulled off sky watching. Because it got to be such a common thing over two months. And that was all around the country. Uh, Muncie, Indiana, in Ohio, near Mansfield, uh, in Missouri, down by Piedmont. Which, again, I'm going to get to all those. We're going to go chronologically here as far as, I mean, that's my normal MO. I I think that that works great. I I have one more in February. I didn't have the exact date, but it was at Woodbury Junction, uh, Rhode Island. Uh, Citizens by the dozens, here we go again, reported seeing what was described as a huge bright light hovering and moving around the sky of their community. Over 150 documented witnesses from all walks of life reported seeing this identical same thing. It was described larger than a vehicle, probably half the size of a normal home, and that it emitted a very bright light. It also was able to hover without making a sound for for long periods of time. 
and most of the sightings seem to take place in or around a United Nuclear Plant that was located nearby. That's a common theme with UFO sightings. Are they fueling up? Are they getting their power? Well, I think the theory that I like the most is that they're watching to see just how dangerous that we're going to be. Oh. So that's, that's what They I better mean. buckle up. <laughs> Well, mid-February, with with no specific day, I have a motorist on a Mexican highway saw an illuminated object in the sky, which he described as a ball of light that overtook his vehicle. As it passed over, it bathed his car in a blue light that emanated from the underside of the craft and caused interference with his car's radio and remained above the vehicle for quite a while before just flying away. February 14th, a DC-8 cargo flight was traveling from St. Louis to Dallas. About 2.30 in the morning over Oklahoma, they saw what looked like another aircraft approaching. The pilot and the co-pilot were watching as the object suddenly shot up towards them, came level with the plane, took a sudden sharp turn, and then was suddenly straight ahead of them, stopping at a distance at about 300 yards. So they kind of maneuvered so they wouldn't collide with it. They studied it as closely as they could, describing it as a, as a disc-shaped craft with a transparent dome on top with a highly polished silvery finish. The pilot used the plane's weather radar to confirm that there was actually a solid object directly in front of them. Now, as they approached it, the craft dropped 300 feet abruptly, just straight down. And as they passed overhead, they were able to look kind of down through the dome of the craft, and they could see two to three shadowy shapes, humanoid-type figures see the pilots. inside the dome of the craft. And then as they passed over, the object vanished out of sight. So we jumped to March 1st, 1973, a little area called Sailors Lake, Pennsylvania. There were 42 different flashing lights observed by multiple witnesses during a three-hour period. All of the events took place over what is called Sailors Lake in eastern Pennsylvania. It's uh, right up near the New Jersey border, actually. A dozen witnesses observed the lights flying above and crossing the lake, uh, including one state trooper. Now, this state trooper, Jeffrey Hans, was sent out to investigate some of the reports when he himself witnessed four of these flashing lights coming across the lake from west to east. Uh, he said it, which it basically looked like a Christmas tree lit up that was flying. Huh. Uh, so I, I'm assuming this, the triangle shape, yeah. you know, kind of tradition. He goes, these events continued through most of March 1973. So basically the entire month of March, but starting on March 1st. Uh, over a three-county area there in eastern Pennsylvania, making it one of the longest and with the most witnessed reportings of any other UFO sightings to date. Well, I have a couple more sightings from Mexico. In late March, multiple witnesses in San Pedro witnessed a luminous craft in the sky moving at an extraordinary rate of speed. And roughly a week before that, on the night of March 14th, brothers Juan and Ruben Hernandez witnessed a glowing round object overhead as they worked at the La Prieta Mine. Now, the light approached the two men, causing them to run for their lives. And they, they ran, and they alerted other employees and supervisors. And these other employees came out, and they went to investigate. They saw the strange object sort of hanging motionless in the sky for several minutes before it rose into the air and disappeared out of sight at tremendous speed. Uh, Ruben would later tell the press that the object vanished into an area locally known as the Zone of Silence, mm. which was known to have a history of strange sightings and phenomena. Well, then in April, aliens come to Missouri, our home state here. April 6th, 1973, in a little town, Ilsnior, Missouri. I'm not even sure where that's at, I'll be honest. Uh, At approximately 1130 in the morning, um, a domed disc-shaped object, as it was described, with landing gear, portholes, also, you know, witnessable, lands in the woods about four miles from a small town in Islianor, Missouri. Upon investigation at the landing site, they do find three indented holes. Uh, This is presumed to be made from that landing gear, going with a large area of flattened foliage. So like something had laid down the landing gear, had dug into the ground a little bit, but it had flattened all the foliage in that area. Now they said, This disc would have been somewhere probably in the vicinity of what they would call 15, 20 foot. So not a huge uh, saucer shaped with a dome, but said they did notice that dogs and stuff were barking in the area. They had noticed it. Some other local witnesses had uh, responded that they, they thought people or something was trying to break into their houses. 
So again, here we kind of have the whole E.T. extraterrestrial movie concept. Maybe it landed, the aliens got out, and they were kind of around in this area looking in windows. There was all kinds of stuff that occurred that night of things that got later tied to this event. Then we jump just a few days later, April 10th, 1973, in Stockard County, Missouri. Sheriffs and others reported at least three UFOs over what is Bernie and Dexter. Uh, which were round, pivoting, and pulsating lighted crafts, by the description that they give. And as they said, the crafts hovered and moved around. The lights changed from a white to a red to a blue. They moved erratically across the sky, different altitudes, different speeds, different directions, um, starting, stopping, changing the speed. And again, to like what Bill was saying, it was a very silent. There was no noise. Nothing was being emitted from it. Uh, So again, They came through Missouri uh, and moved on. So also in April, I don't have an exact date again for this one, from Milan, Indiana, Reed Thompson had quite a bizarre encounter while he was at work in his auto repair store. Two strange men arrived. Men in black. Very odd fellows. Well, it doesn't describe them as being dressed in black, but bear with me here. Okay. They each had a very disturbing appearance, according to Reed. And long hair, they wore tan jumpsuits and very heavy gloves, is the way he described them. When he spoke, he said their voices were mechanical and monotone. Oh, that's weird. Like a robotic kind of voice. And they seemed to know all about a UFO encounter that he had had in 1967, right down to the exact day, and the fact that he had taken a photograph of said UFO. Like seven years ago. And they demanded the photo and the negative from Reed. It sounds like men in black, but I'm not yeah. sure about the long hair. and These were men in tan. Yeah, men in tan. Now, while this was happening, another employee at the shop, he stepped outside to see if there was anybody else out there, and he saw what he said was a 1969 bright yellow Buick LeSabre with very dark windows parked in front of the shop. And when he, As he walked over to look inside, curious, he said the vehicle was completely empty on the inside. No steering wheel, no seats. What? When the two strangers came out, He, of course, backed away from the car, Um, but as he did, he bumped elbows with one of the men, and when he did, he said he immediately felt a strange sensation passing through his body. Now, uh, this employee, which I didn't have a name for him, strangely passed away suddenly two years later, and two autopsies were unable to determine his cause of death at the time. Wow. Now, Reed would have other encounters with strangers and their vehicle that year. Uh, including one time when it appeared just inches from his bumper one day as he was driving to work and followed him all the way into the shop. <laughs> and when he got out to confront them, a blue flash temporarily blinded him, and when he could see again, the car was gone. Straight up, men in black. Look here. Yeah. Blink. Also in April, a flying saucer would land in the middle of a playground of a primary school in Ipo Perak in Malaysia. We're going to travel a little bit here. And several tiny humanoids in shiny white suits emerged from this little craft Uh, but when one of the teachers approached to see what was going on, they ran back into their ship and took off, (laughs) vanished. We've had enough of you. We're out of here. On the afternoon of May 15, uh, was another pretty, uh, I would say, uh, famous encounter, which is the, the Sandown, uh, I believe it's called Sam the Sandown Clown, but it is sort of a weird alien-esque encounter when you, when you hear about it. And I had it on the list to do as an individual case, but I think it works much better as part of this bigger story. Uh, and this was on the Isle of Wight. Um, so over We've talked about that before in other podcasts. Seven-year-old Faye was playing with a friend when they both heard a siren-like sound. They looked around trying to figure out where the noise was coming from, and, and then they started to search. Uh, you know, little kids, they're curious. They want to know what's going on. They made their way through a hedge, and on the other side, they found like a swampy meadow. And as soon as they went through the hedge, the noise stopped. Now, they started to explore this, this area. I don't think they'd been there before. And while they were crossing a footbridge, a, they, they noticed a shadowy figure underneath the bridge. What came out was a seven-foot-tall creature that moved in a strange hopping motion. I remember this story now. It had like a very clown-like type yes. face, but it was robotic and sort of alien-looking. Uh, it made its way to a strange metallic hut. Now, the, the children described it as a hut. I think under the circumstances, we would probably say it was a UFO but that this had no windows, and it turned out, you know, I think most people agree that this was some sort of spaceship. Yeah, Um, a craft. This creature came out again holding an object that sort of resembled a microphone, and um, it turned, it waved to the children, and asked if they were still there using the object as sort of a universal translator. 
Uh, it took, it had a short conversation with the kids. And then after their friendly interaction, the creature led the children into the metallic hut, which they said had two floors inside. And while they Come were inside, with us, we have candy. Yeah. Well, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> I, I, I'm dressed as a clown kind of robot badly. thing. Yeah. While, while inside, they continued to have a conversation with this creature. And after about 30 minutes or so, they left the craft and they ran back home, eager to tell their parents of their, their strange encounter. Wow. Uh, there was another encounter early in, in 73. Uh, I don't have the exact date on this one, but it was in, in Piedmont, Missouri, which we've talked about on earlier mm-hmm. episodes. Mm-hmm. The UFO capital of Missouri. Several members of the local high school team, as well as their coaches, witnessed a strange craft land in a field as they were heading home from a game. Now, they couldn't quite make out the shape. They said it, it was too dark, and, and it was only illuminated by its windows, which were a few feet apart. They figured it was either cigar or saucer-shaped. Uh, they watched it for about 10 minutes or so before it shot straight up and out of sight. Now, about 12 miles away later that same evening in Mill Spring, Missouri, Edith Boatwright was getting ready for bed when she noticed strange lights from a low-flying object outside of her home. Um, I guess she, she stepped out to look at it, and it disappeared. Again, shot right off. June 2nd, 1973, I've got a little report here. It's Diverton, Illinois. A large single UFO was seen with uh, what was described as different colored blinking lights, like that of an aircraft was spotted. And it was actually used in that terminology. People thought it was some form of an aircraft, more so initially than a UFO. Uh, However, they said this was larger and brighter. It had red and orange light uh, beneath the ship that also illuminated the entire landscape as it flew over. So again, while it might have looked like an aircraft, it was illuminating the ground with this orange and red. And from what I could tell uh, by the few newspaper clippings I could find, it was almost like this was like a beam that would like shift around. It wasn't just like a stationary yeah. that, that you know flew over top. It was more of like it was looking for something. It was trying to spotlight something. Uh, And then later on, they were like, well, this was no aircraft. It was way too large. It also was reported to move with like little or no sound whatsoever. It was noted that even when it flew above the trees, the leaves didn't even like Hmm. bristle or move in the wind. So it was almost like a magnetism type of flotation device, if you will. There was absolutely no sound and no movement of anything around it. So I thought that was kind of an interesting one. Well, the story that brought me to the 1973 UFO wave was that of James Richard and his daughter, Vania, on June 28th in Columbia, Missouri. Now, they heard an odd thrashing sound outside the home, and when they went and looked out the window, they saw two brilliant white beams of light shining through the night sky. These beams were coming from an oval-shaped object about 15 feet in diameter. Now, you're in Missouri. James does what any Missourian is going to do when he sees something strange in the he yard. He grab a gun and starts shooting it. He takes off to go grab his gun and calls local authorities while he's at it. I think that's deep bred into our genes here. When he comes back to the window, he watched the craft fly off towards the north and disappear. Now, the next day, investigators did find broken tree limbs, crushed grass, and burns on some of the tree leaves as high as 35 feet above the ground, as well as marks two feet deep in the ground. So kind of similar to the one you yeah, told so earlier. It definitely landed and moved around and burnt tree leaves. And uh, Fourth of July in West Springfield, Massachusetts at 8.30 p.m., Cecily, the main witness of this encounter, uh, a woman in her early 70s, and this is not her real name. She did not want to be publicly associated with the story. Very common at that time. A lot of people feel lends some credence to it. She didn't want any popularity. She didn't want any money. She just wanted someone to know her story. Uh, but she had stepped out to smoke a cigarette on the patio when she witnessed a large disc-shaped object descend through the treetops. It landed in a nearby field before rising and floating off just above the treetops. And she rushed in to go get her husband, but by the time they came back out, it had disappeared altogether. On July 7th in Odessa, Texas, multiple witnesses saw a disc-shaped object hovering over a radio tower. I'm going to jump into July 13th, 1933, uh, in the little town of Emdom, Missouri. It's about 3.30 a.m. in the morning. A witness was awakened by their dog barking, and immediately a UFO was spotted upon looking out the front door. Described as an egg shape or at least oblong. Now, not the cigar shape, but they said it was more of a condensed, more of like an egg or oblong, about the size of an average car of the time. Well, again... Back in 1933, those cars were pretty good yeah, sized. They were good sized. You didn't have compact cars back then. Yeah, yeah. So it seemed to be almost iridescent with a bright orange color being kind of the outermost hull. 
and then as if you were to go further into the egg shape, uh, it changed colors to kind of a brighter red. They said they related this to an egg because it was almost like looking at an egg without a hard shell. If you ever had chickens, grew up on a farm, I grew up on a little hobby farm, occasionally a chicken will lay an egg without the hard you know, uh, ex- exterior, so you just kind of get this mucus bag. And that's what they said this UFO really looked like. You could see iridescence, and it would change darker colors as it went to the inside. That's weird. Kind of creepy. But they said this, the witness said that it had light being emitted not, uh, had it not been so bright, it was as if you could almost see through it entirely. But this light was coming out of this egg, and they said it almost kind of illuminated the the shadow silhouette of a single pilot inside. That's weird. Uh, very weird. And they, some people even said, well, it looked like there was veins that you could see. Yeah. So it was almost like... Like a biological. Maybe thing. it was a biological alien-esque, weird. like out of the movie Aliens. Uh, August 9th, in Exeter, New Hampshire, a father and son were driving down the highway when they saw a UFO in a field on the side of the road, and they both clearly recalled seeing a humanoid figure standing outside of it. Well, then I have August through October down south. Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, and Mississippi, they all had this rash of UFO sightings. And I think Bill's going to kind of detail some of these out. But from hundreds and hundreds of witnesses, many of which included various police officers, highway patrol, because this was over such a long period of time, they were getting help, asking for help from other states. Uh, It was described as this oblong, various colored, bright, brightly flashing light. A uh, plane slash UFO slash cigar that flew erratically in different directions, changing movement, speed, and almost like playful type, uh, like they were chasing each other across the sky. Uh, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't the norm. It was like there was multiples of these. They were different sizes. And Bill, I think you said you had some different sightings during that time frame down south. Yeah, I have a lot of sightings from the south throughout that time frame. Um, and I'll, I, we'll just proceed chronologically. So it'll, there'll be others that I drop in, obviously. So September 9th, several teenagers in Laurel Grove Cemetery in Savannah, Georgia, saw a UFO land. And I, I kind of giggled a little when I read this story. It opened up a door and let out 10 big, black, hairy dogs which ran off into the night. Oh, wow. They said it glowed brightly as it landed, and then it dulled as it came closer to the ground. Okay, I I have to say this. Now, with you saying that, I'm an avid watcher, as you know, of many TV series. Uh, Secret of Skinwalker Ranch. Recently, spoiler alert if you haven't watched them, I'm going to let a little details here. They are encountering what they believe are dire wolf sightings. And when you mentioned the, the alien lowered its craft down, opened the door, and a bunch of big black hairy dogs they just released into the wilderness yeah they're finding some really weird stuff on the show they're finding like bones with these huge bite marks that penetrated crushed the bones that they said fits the description the jaw pressures so aliens are releasing these dire wolves back on us but it wasn't just in the united states in 1973 uh, you know there was a hotbed of ufo sightings also in spain and belgium brazil australia as well as other countries but here's another pretty well known case in iran uh, involving us air force pilots and that was on september 17th 1973 it was just after midnight in tehran iran two consecutive uh, united states f4 interceptor planes attempted to capture a wild a widely reported ufo that had been sighted this had been uh, reported all day long by civilians now each time the pilots would make visual contact they're up here flying around with it they're actually seeing it out of their cockpit and they try to home in on it with missiles to attack because again you know that's that's what we do in the united states we we don't know what it is we shoot it Uh, trying to focus in these missiles to attack this dome-shaped flying saucer. Uh, The electronics on board of both of their planes would malfunction briefly enough to allow it to escape so that they couldn't pinpoint. And this occurred over and over and over. Um, So again, this UFO escaped. They were not able to target it. They really weren't able to gather any more information about it. But, I mean, here we have two Air Force pilots uh, that are directly involved with it, spot it not only on radar, but you know, physically up in the sky 
and it playfully uh, maneuvers around them. But not only on planet Earth, not even in other countries, here's another interesting one. A tale from NASA, from Astronaut, September 20th, 1973. It was the 59th day of the flight of the Skylab 3. Astronauts witnessed and photographed a strange, uh, brightly glowing red source of light about 30 to 50 nautical miles from their current location in space. They noted it was brighter than any other planets around them. So it definitely stood out. They said it moved around. It wasn't like in a rotation. It wasn't slow. Uh, different altitudes, again, what we normally are describing as, as sightings here on Earth, uh, it, it had all of those. They took pictures. They got video of it. They physically saw it at their little port windows. Uh, so UFO spotted in space by NASA <laughs> astronauts. Well, just three days later on the 23rd in Puebla, Mexico, Witnesses heard two loud explosions before seeing a bizarre glowing craft crossing the sky and disappearing into a nearby gorge. They said as soon as it disappeared, a noise that made the earth shake rang out. As the first two witnesses went to investigate, another local, Alfonso Hernandez, joined them, and he later reported seeing two living beings covered in fur-like straw. Uh. Later investigation to the site revealed damage that looked like it was caused by an avalanche, that Hernandez said was not there when they first went to the scene to look at, at see what had happened. In late September, somewhere between Columbus and Mansfield, Ohio, on I-71, a witness noticed a flashing light trailing behind his car, first on the right, then on the left, and then suddenly right in front of him. Then it sped off into the night ahead of him. Now, he was driving about 70 miles per hour at the time. It's important to note that, because then he believes he lost consciousness for some reason, and the next thing he remembered was waking up behind the wheel going down the interstate at 90 miles per hour. Oh, wow. When he got home, he realized he couldn't account for nearly an hour of time and began to experience weird psychic episodes. He went out uh, to, to go through hypnotic regression to try to understand what was going on. And in, during that process, he recalled that after, after he'd seen the lights, he remembered driving along a, a lonely, narrow, tree-lined road for some time. And it was there that he saw three entities on the road, one in front of his car, and two beside it. They appeared to be floating, and then suddenly there was a craft approaching from above, which, uh, before he knew what was going on, he was floating towards this craft. Then he remembers being inside of it on a table with the entity standing around him. They were wearing metallic-looking clothing. One creature was examining his legs. Another had an instrument up by his head. Suddenly he was blinded by a bright light, and then he was back in his car with the UFO moving upwards and out of sight. So I'm going to jump ahead to... Probably the rest of the entire episode is going to go around the month of October in 1973. Uh, that month would be known as the month of the humanoids. And I'm going to start off with a little story here that um, it was a police chief, uh, Greenhaw, in Falkville, Alabama. And this story, in his own words, ruined his career and his life. Chief of Police Jeff Greenhaw of uh, Falkville, Alabama, received an anonymous panicked call of someone who said a UFO has landed in a nearby field. Now, Greenhaw rarely ever spoke of this incident uh, in reports, nor did he ever try to gain profit or fame from what is about to happen this night. He did say it changed his life forever, and he soon resigned as police chief uh, basically in the coming months. At first, he thought it was some crazy person, this is his own words, or someone pulling a prank call. They called into the police station. From what I understood, uh, the chief had just gotten off work. He had just arrived home. Uh, however, this locale was close to him and his house. So the police station again calls and said, hey, this is over in your neighborhood. I know you're on your way home. Would you want to check it out? Well, he'd actually already got home was, you know, starting to get comfortable for the night. We've all been there as managers, you know, kind of deal. Hey, we need you back in. So he, he finishes getting back his stuff and he goes and jumps in the car uh, and heads, I guess, a short distance to where this is at. He had no problem finding it. He was familiar with the territory. And when he arrived, he immediately spotted what he described as a six foot or slightly taller humanoid in a metallic suit. He stated at first, I thought it was like aluminum foil, but as I approached it uh, with the headlights of the cop car, it was definitely not some cheap-made costume. He said it looked like nickel and mercury were rubbed together with no apparent seams or joints of the outfit. 
Now, again, I thought that was an interesting description, definitely of its time. Yeah. You know, nickel and mercury rubbed together. There was no seams, no zipper, no buttons, no joints whatsoever. He said the head and the neck almost looked like it was one piece, but he did believe it was some type of an outf- outfit or breathing apparatus, costume, and there was something on the inside of it. Um, he grabbed his Polaroid camera and said something to the effect, and I, I can just almost see this. This guy walks up and he goes, I've got this Polaroid here. He goes, howdy there, partner, and quickly took four photographs of this creature. Uh, now, he, he took the pictures. Apparently, it didn't frighten this humanoid. He took the pictures, and again, this is Polaroid. They're slowly developing. So he takes them back to the car. He puts them on the dash and kind of in between the seats there. Uh, as he entered the squad car, you know, he's watching these Polaroid pictures on the console kind of develop, and he's looking back out, and it's like, that thing is still there. It, it hasn't moved. So he decided to turn on the blue flashing lights on top of the car, hoping to be able to see more clearly the suit. Is this a prank? What, what, what am I being you know, pranked here? What's going on? Upon doing so, the creature jumped and began to flee. He said it jumped uh, like bounds, like 15, 20 foot. He said he jumped in the police car and followed haste immediately. This thing just tore off through the fields. And again, from what it was described, it was kind of barbed wire fence field sections off. So this thing was jumping over the fences. He was on a gravel road driving somewhere around 35 mile an hour. And he said it was just all he could do to even keep up with it. And he he continued this for sounded like quite some time, but eventually lost control uh, of the cop car and the loose gravel and crashed with the creature just continuing to run off, you know, run, forest, run kind of thing, and it vanished into the woods. Now, he quickly learned that the people he had called friends turned on him. They ridiculed him. They ridiculed and made fun of his story. He ended up resigning a few months later. He just wanted a fresh start, and he wanted to put that all behind him. People would come to his door. They would ask for interviews. He would turn them down. He, he didn't want to talk about it. He got angry about it. Uh, He said later on in one of the few interviews that he did, he's like, I know what I seen. I don't care if anyone else believes me. I know what I seen. I was a police officer. You know, I'm, I have to admit the guy, I mean, he was familiar with the territory. He's like, this is not supposed to be here. (laughs) This is not normal. No, I did not see a deer. I did not see a cow. I did not see any of this (laughs) stuff. I know what all that is. And it just infuriated him. Now, he kept those four Kodak uh, photographs. I think I saw one of them when I was doing the research. Well, he kept them for over a decade. And he said, this haunted me. He goes, I looked at those weekly, maybe even more than weekly, to convince myself I did see what I thought I saw that everybody else was telling me, man, you, you're, you, know, you, just, you didn't see that. That didn't happen. Until almost the 10th year anniversary to date, he comes home and finds someone had broken into his house, stealing those four original photographs and his rifle and his service revolver. Ironically, that's the only three items he had with him in the car that night. Again, he'd got home, he'd started, I assume, undressing out of his outfit and everything and had to put more clothes on and go back out. Those items were not even kept together in the same location of the house. He's like, whoever did this, whatever did this, knew exactly the three items I had, the the pictures, my service revolver, and my rifle. That's the three things I had, and took them. They didn't take anything else. Wow. Um, So he he said the burglar, in a way, seemed to cleanse him. Uh, (laughs) He goes, I had nothing then to refer back on to. And that's when he actually started talking about it in one of the few interviews was after that burglary had taken effect. Greenshaw and his wife continued to live in the area. They did not move off. They ended up raising five children, three of which were adopted. So, I mean, they sounded like good folks, you know, trying to take care, but changed his life forever. Well, on to, on to more days in October. On the 1st in Anthony Hill, Tennessee, during a thunderstorm, three teenagers reported seeing a huge, hairy, robot-like creature in the woods. What is the deal with these hairy dog-robot things? 
Several other witnesses in the area also reported seeing a UFO over the area where the teens claimed to have seen the creature. Normally, I would have left that one out, but because there were other people that saw a UFO in the area. On the 4th, in Simi Valley, California, a witness driving along the Simi Freeway saw a triangular object in a dust cloud at the side of the road. On top of the craft was a clear bubble-shaped dome that seemed to be swiveling around, and on the underside was a rope that looked to be hanging out of an opening. A humanoid creature appeared from the top side of the craft. It looked around, and then it like saw the onlookers and scrambled back out of sight. Uh, they said it was the size of a human adult and appeared to be wearing some kind of silver wet suit. A whirring noise started, and then the bubble on top began to spin faster, and a fog appeared as if from nowhere and covered the craft. When the fog disappeared, the craft was gone. Like a cloaking device or something. You had said these hairy things, these yeah. robots. We've talked about shiny. I'm sitting over envisioning, is this Chewbacca and C-3PO if they had a baby? I was thinking of the, what was it, the robot monster, the old sci-fi movie with the robot body and the, ro- the or no, the gorilla body and the robot head. Oh, yeah, thing. yeah, the gorilla body on it. Yeah. Yep. It's like, yeah. this is some weird stuff. On October 10th in Muncie, Indiana, that night, several hundred people, uh, as many as 700 to 1,000, according, depending on what version of the story, reported seeing mysterious multicolored lights in the sky, with about 150 or more people calling the police station over the course of two hours. I'm going to bring up one that we've already touched upon. We've actually already did an entire episode, but it, it goes right into line with this, and that is the Charles Hickson and Calvin Harker uh, incident in Mississippi. And it was October 10th, 1973, right here in the two, the the year and the month that we're talking about. Uh, I'll just kind of give a brief one for anybody. If you want to know more about it, again, we did an entire episode on it. Episode 83, Alien Abductions. Yep. It it was, it's a good one. Uh, Basically a cool evening uh, there in South New Orleans, or San San Timothy Parish, I believe it was in New Orleans. Uh, uh, First off, there was a sighting similar to the craft that was spotted the night before uh, in New Orleans. And then it seems to possibly reappeared for this incident. Uh, It would change two fishermen's life in Pascadoula, Mississippi forever. And that was Charles Hickson. And he had went fishing. He was an older gentleman, but he had went fishing with this 18-year-old Calvin Harker. And again, we, we did an entire episode on this, but the older Hickson and younger Harker were allegedly uh, abducted while fishing on a private pier. The two friends said they were out on the dock. They heard this buzzing noise approaching their backside. They were frightened by what they described as a football-shaped UFO with several flashing spotlights going out in all directions. They froze in panic and were then each abducted uh, for a short period of time, taken on the ship and the older man hickson actually says he was levitated onto the ship so these aliens didn't like pick them up throw them over their shoulders or or anything weird like that he, they just went over and like put their arms around him he starts hovering and they just kind of push him into the ship now they do remember waking up on the ship they remember being taken down hallways they remember kind of a sterile hospital like room uh, where it appeared these alien creatures were observing them closely uh, in like some type of an exam. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump through a, a bunch of little short blurbs here real quick. October 14th, a woman from Dayton, Ohio, reports an oblong-shaped object with blinking lights landing in a field and killing two cows. Did it land on them? Uh, well, I don't know. It doesn't say. <laughs> After midnight on the 15th in Omro, Wisconsin, a witness awoke to find his bedroom flooded with orange light, and then suddenly three humanoid figures appeared, about five foot tall with gray skin and bald heads. Uh, he blacked out, and the next thing he knew, he was up against the wall with the creatures examining him. One had an oval-shaped object that it would pass over his body, and he watched as it displayed the bones inside, like a real-time x-ray type device. Oh, wow. You know, as the creature brought the object up by his head, the, the guy blacked out again. He didn't tell anyone about this for a long time until later when his girlfriend confessed to a similar encounter, at which point he came forward. That same night in Beria, Tennessee... The Klein family was awoken by their dogs barking wildly, and when they looked outside to see what was going on, they saw a UFO with bright lights in the nearby woods. The next morning, when they went to the area, they found claw-like tracks as well as marks made by the craft's landing gear in the area where they had seen the lights. That same night, near Gulfport, Missouri, a taxi driver saw an oblong UFO with a blue light fly overhead. It landed in front of his vehicle, which mysteriously stalled at the exact same time with all the electronics going dead, Uh, He sat there in the vehicle, not sure what to do, 
when a claw-like hand tapped on his window as something rushed past him. That one was creepy. (laughs) Right out of a horror film. The next day, on the 16th in Burbank, California, two children reported a UFO landing in their backyard. According to the children, it had a pointed top with light coming out from underneath. Four figures inside the ship invited one of the children to look inside, but before he could, the craft vanished. That night on the 16th, as the 16th turned into the 17th in Lehigh, uh, in Lehigh, Utah, a woman, her three children, and one of their neighbor kids were all abducted from the family home and taken aboard a craft. They were subjected to intense medical examinations by strange humanoids. Now, the primary witness recalled being in a big room with lots of lights and buttons and seeing four or five humanoids and at least two other human beings. The humanoids had large heads and had two or three big claws that she said open and closed like a clasp. Um, like a lobster kind yeah. of creature. But later on the 17th, two men were driving along Route 23 heading out of New Jersey when they reported seeing a large round silver craft hovering over a field. As they watched the craft, it began to descend. They stopped. They got out of the car to watch, which is far braver than I would think I would be, but <laughs> I'm also dumb enough I might do it. Uh, seven humanoids emerged from the craft after it touched down. Uh, sometime later that same night in Watauga, Tennessee, witnesses saw a copper-colored circular UFO hover only a foot or two from the ground. From an open doorway, a humanoid creature roughly six feet tall reached out and attempted to grab two children in its claw-like hands. There were at least six other UFO reports in the region on that same day. Also on the 17th, Loxley, Alabama. Clarence Patterson was driving his pickup along the highway when a cigar-shaped UFO illuminated his truck with a green light. The next thing he knew, his truck was lifting off the ground. Oh, wow. It was pulled into the overhead craft, and six robot-like beings dragged him from the truck's cabin. Um, Now, Patterson was certain that these beings could read his thoughts, and then he blacked out. When he woke up, he was in the driver's seat of his still-moving truck, traveling 90 miles per hour with no idea how long he'd been out. A little later, outside Danielsville, Georgia, Paul Brown had to suddenly stop after an oval-shaped craft landed in the middle of the road about 300 feet in front of him. Two four-foot-tall creatures came from the underside of the UFO. They looked around for a moment before scrambling back inside the UFO after realizing they were being observed. And then the craft rose up and sped off at incredible speed. As the evening wore on, Europa, Missouri, drivers saw a 50-foot-wide UFO hovering over Highway 82. One driver said he was watching the craft when his vehicle suddenly stalled, and another car behind him, he said he could tell it had suddenly died too because it just coasted to a halt behind him. Right. Above the first UFO, there was a second UFO with a beam of light that seemed to be connecting both of them. And as they watched, a creature descended from the top craft into the bottom one, and then shortly after, both disappeared. On the 18th, the coin helicopter incident, which is another major incident that came out of this. Around 11 p.m., a U.S. Army Reserve Huey helicopter was flying from Columbus, Ohio to Cleveland with Captain Lawrence Coyne on board, a pilot with 36 years of flying experience. He'd seen a thing or two. There were also three other military men as his passengers, one of which was a flight medic, so uh, someone else with flight experience. One of the men on board pointed to a light on the horizon, a red light, said it seemed out of place, and then it began to approach. The pilot took immediate evasive action to dive out of the path of the craft, when suddenly the craft stopped midair. It was a cigar-shaped object, slightly domed, with windows along the top of the dome. It shone a spotlight on them for a moment that was brilliant green in color, and then flew off over Mansfield and disappeared over Lake Erie. After the craft disappeared, the men in the helicopter realized they were 2,000 feet higher than they thought they were. Wow. Uh, They believed that the UFO had somehow lifted them up while shining the beam on them. Now, as if that wasn't enough, there were multiple witnesses on the ground that could independently verify this story, including a mom and her kids that were driving along Route 430, and they pulled over to watch lights in the sky and witnessed a green spotlight effect. Hmm. Now, the pilot of the helicopter, Larry Coyne, would go on to say, as a result of my experience, I am convinced this object was real and that these types of incidents should require thorough investigation. So we could probably continue to go on and on about other sightings, but I think it's time for headlines. We're going to, I think we're going to truncate our, our headlines and our questions a little bit because we've, we've run long. There was a lot of information on this. A one. lot. My headline uh, was taken from an online article from Statistica. It was written by Kathleen Burkholz, and it's titled, Are UFO Sightings Taking Off Again? It was something she wrote in June 30th, 2023. 
July 2nd marks World UFO Day, UFO. Belief has long been considered a fringe phenomenon, but those uh, who want to believe were given a boost in 2021 as U.S. intelligence services delivered an official report on the unidentified aerial phenomenon to Congress. It showed that all 143 unexplained sightings between November 2004 and March 2021, only one UAP was later identified as a deflating balloon. Now, in early 2023, another unclassified report by the Office of the Director of National Intelligence revealed 171 not yet identified flying objects out of 366 recorded between March 2021 and August 2022. So definitely it's ramping up. Uh, Considering this renewed buzz about UFOs or UAPs, as we're now starting to call them, uh, How have global UFO sightings been developing in recent years? Well, there is a National UFO Reporting Center, or an agency in the United States, which documents just that. All the sightings, unexplained aerial phenomenons all over the world, and interestingly, sightings have been picking up yet again. While there were two dips in 2018 and also a dip in 2021, those were once more around the 5,000-ish counts of alleged UFO sightings in 2020, uh, 2022. This is still below the peaks of 8,800 in 2014 and 7,400 sightings in 2020. When conspiracy beliefs were running high during the onset, of course, of the whole corona pandemic. Now, in 2022, 17% of Americans said they thought it was likely that aliens will visit Earth just below the global average of 18%, and below responses recorded in India, China, and even in Latin America. As of May 2023, she rounds out the headline. She goes, there have been close to 1,400 sightings since May of 2023. Uh, which could you know, obviously signal a slower year for UFO reports. Yet with later reports starting to come in, always a possibility and interest of unidentified flying objects renewed in the aftermath of February's Chinese spy balloon sage. Uh, and Bill and I talked about this on the podcast as well. The jury on, on that, that year's UFO UAP frequency is still kind of out there. It seemed like the water was definitely getting muddied, you know. Why do we have all these spy balloons flying over the United (laughs) States all of a sudden and how are they making it so far? It was it you know, what was it? We don't we still don't know. We still don't. So, um I'm just gonna summarize mine real quick. From MissouriNet.com by Alice by Elisa Nelson, dated June fourteenth, twenty twenty four. Greetings, Earthlings. Piedmont opens UFO Capital of Missouri Park. And it's exactly what it sounds like. Yay! Piedmont was voted Missouri's UFO capital, and they have opened a park that features such attractions as a 16-foot UFO, a 6-foot-tall alien, and other playground equipment. Go, Piedmont. Uh, Back last year, 2023, they held their first UFO festival and realized that there was just potential for for some tourism dollars in Piedmont because of what happened. Embrace it. Question time. Well, my question is, What's the closest experience you personally might have had with anything even remotely similar to what we've talked about tonight? Tonight? Or have you had something personal? Was that a friend's house? This would have been 2000-ish, give or take. And he said they had seen routinely like a strange object in the sky uh, above the field across the road from his house. And I was there one night. This is obviously here in Missouri. Yeah, here in Missouri, um, um, Dixon area. Okay. And so I was there one night, and we were watching, and he's like, you know, hey, look, there it is. And, you know, well, so I start watching, and there, there's absolutely this strange light. And it wasn't flashing, so it didn't look like a regular plane. And it was just kind of moving, I won't say randomly, or it wasn't moving in a way that was impossible, but it was just kind of moving around and kind of weird, like. Not a normal movement. Um. The longer we waited, we began to notice that we could hear a propeller sound slowly getting louder. So I believe it was an airplane, hmm. but you know, it was just kind of a weird thing. And it just moseyed around the sky. It was like, I don't know, like a drunk driver swerving around, you know, it, <laughs> it was drunken pilot. It doesn't seem like the right way to fly an airplane to me, <laughs> but yeah, it was, uh, we don't know why. And he said he'd seen it on a regular basis. So I don't know why 
there was this plane kind of drunkenly swinging around the sky over this field on a regular basis. But Well, and of course with, you know, United States laws and everything with a plane, they do have to have blinking lights on them. I mean, that is part of their identification. Lights. I mean, maybe it was just a coincidence. Maybe, maybe the sound was just coincidentally like a propeller. Uh, it sounded like a propeller to me. Or sometimes if a light's blinking and it's depending on the distance, it, by the time it processes, you think yeah. it's not blinking. Maybe it looks, you know. I don't know. Uh, we, we never really could, you know, w- with certainty identify what it was because we could only just see the light. So we never saw a shape. Right. But well, yeah, yeah, I mean, that was probably the closest I've been. That's part of the fun is trying to understand what we're seeing. Well, my answer to that question is I've actually shared before on the show, but I, I will share the story again because I think it's fitting is uh, personally with my wife and I, it was about 1991 or 92, the best guess. We'd just been married a couple of years. Uh, we were living in a little remodeled uh, mobile home with an addition down on her parents' uh, property, a couple hundred acres in Falcon, Missouri. And I believe we'd ran to town to get some groceries. I remember we, we had stuff we were, you know, got to carry in. So we had a little minivan and we pulled down this, seriously, their driveway is like a mile long. I mean, it, yeah. it's out there. It's in the middle of the woods. You don't have a lot of that light and stuff from town and, you know, you have all the sounds of the country. But we drove down the long driveway, we'd parked the vehicle, and we got out. And the first thing we just, I think we had a bag of groceries in our hand and we looked at each other and it was just deathly quiet. I mean, you could have heard a pin drop. And that's saying a lot because, one, we were out in the country, but we were literally a stone throw's distance from a two-acre lake that her dad had dug. So, I mean, it was common to have frogs and fish jumping and, you know, none of that. It was just deathly quiet. And then all of a sudden, there was a low light above us. And we we both looked up. I think she was driving. I was on the passenger side. We could still see each other. And there, there, was, there was this disc, I'm guessing 30, maybe 40 foot around. And I would guess 200 foot up. Uh, definitely above the treetop area, but it was just like hovering above our car. There was making no sound. And there was some lights that were changing, like it was getting ready, I thought, to do something. And we were speechless. We just just kind of stood there. <laughs> I mean, the whole incident maybe seriously lasted five seconds. It was very quick. And it just poof, just shot off. And that was it. We never had any other encounters. We quickly unpacked the car, got inside, locked the door because, you know, that's going to be the safest thing to do for any alien is lock yourself in the mobile home. But um, we talked about it. We called the local uh, Fort Leonard Wood, which is not far away. And we did ask, are you guys doing like any type of weird, you know, flights or something tonight? Like not like they would have told would, us. Yeah. Oh, yes, we're doing a top secret, you know, flight. But We've got uh, backwards engineered UFOs <laughs> that were flying over your house. Don't worry about yeah, it. Yeah, it's like, I, I think we just did that to check the box, but it's like, yeah, they're not going to tell us anything. And of course, they denied everything. So I think it was the next day we called down to Springfield, Missouri, the local television station, and they did say they had had multiple sightings called in of something similar in Missouri that night. But it was dropped, to my knowledge, it never aired on the news. Nothing was ever more said about it. But, I mean, that's about as up close and personal as I, I thought we could get. Well, mine, well, I had one question, but I think I changed my mind. What is your favorite, like, I don't want to say science fiction, like, I don't want you to think the movie Alien or Aliens or whatever, but your your favorite movie you've ever seen about, like, regular kind of alien UFO stuff, like a Close Encounters of the Third Kind kind of movie. I would be torn there. I, I loved the movie E.T. Ugh. I know. I know. I hey, it's like my e. initials, dude. Well, yeah, but I never thought of next, it that way. But. My second one, and it's not really traditional, but that's Stargate. Stargate, the original movie, just blew my mind. But it really opened the doors. I'm not sure if that was a good thing or a bad thing, but it really got me thinking. So that's my two-part answer. When I was a kid, I liked Stargate. I don't think it aged well, though. You don't. I don't. I don't like it. As I went much back now. and watched it seriously like two weeks ago. Yeah, but you're obsessed. I'm weird. You love that movie to a degree that I, I even when I liked it, I didn't like it as much as you did. Uh, the whole ancient Egypt alien esque. Oh yeah. So I saw a movie. Uh, probably saw it on Netflix or something. Uh, it's a 2014 movie called Alien Abduction. It's a found footage type movie. Okay. So it's like the Blair Witch or Paranormal Activity, but it's about 
like this family that goes camping and then there's a series of like UFO sightings and then entities in the woods and it just builds and builds and builds until, you know, at the end, you know, there's this full blown alien abduction slash encounter. Thing. Definitely more of a supposed to be realistic event yeah. documentation kind of. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, you know, definitely not real. I mean, the special effects are not great, but with found footage, you can kind of hide some of that. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I really enjoyed it when I watched it. There's another one. I think it's called Dark Skies, if I remember. That's there was about, a series called Dark Skies. Well, and, and maybe I'm getting confused. There's a, there's another one. It's about a, a mom whose kid starts having alien abduction experiences. I believe um, oh, what's, J.K. Simmons is in it, if I remember correctly. He's yeah, like I a I don't think this is the same. A yeah, Dark Series was something that was out for multiple seasons, and it was a very uh, V-type yeah. series. I think I remember hearing about it, but th- that's another good one where her kid starts having these like weird memories and, and whatnot. And it turns out he's been, he's been being abducted on a regular basis and it's building to them taking him permanently and her trying to stop that. That's interesting. Well, whether you're a believer or non-believer or maybe a fence straddler somewhere in between, we hope that uh, at least we've brought you some interesting stories that you can relate to, talk about, cuss and discuss, as they say. Uh, this I've never is, heard that before. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that saying, cuss and discuss. But we hope that you've enjoyed listening to us tonight as much as we have enjoyed sharing it with all of our audience out there. We appreciate you. Thanks so much for listening. Hey, real quick, call to action. I think Eric would agree. We'd like to grow this Nightmares on the Lost Highway. Absolutely. If you could, if you're listening on Apple, if you would go and give us a review and, and rate us. Uh, if you have some feedback, that's fine, too. Uh, whatever, whatever platform you're listening, follow us, rate us, give us some reviews. That helps get some recognition. And gets our name out there. We do have a Facebook page, Nightmares on the Lost Highway. You can easily find us if you want to communicate with us. If you want to share some uh, possibilities for future podcasts with us, you know, reach out. We want to talk with you guys. Your long story short is longer than most people's long story. I'm a long-winded person, were, Bill. You used to work with me. You know this. Trying to summarize a story, and you 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 told almost the same story you did the last time. <laughs> <clears throat> No, I'm, I'm dedicated. I like my stuff. That's I was yeah. I was like I'll just let Eric summarize it, and then you just told most of told the, story. the whole story all over again. <laughs> right in front and just above them, they said it was Shigar. Well, Shigar. I said it. You said Shigar twice tonight. I'm not sure where Shigar yeah. is. I want to take a time to thank the people that helped bring this all together. Uh, Alex Tudor, you can almost call him our producer at this point. Sarah Tudor, who also helps with some of the technical stuff. I want to take a moment to extend thanks to Eric for letting us use his space to record in kind of our makeshift studio. I, in turn, would like to thank Bill for, one, putting up with me and uh, <laughs> using this camaraderie to do something we both very much love and enjoy doing. And thank Bill's family for allowing him to spend all the time to work and clean up our recordings and present them in what uh, you hear in the final uh, terms. Uh, the final edition, if you will. And I'd like to thank all of you for continuing to to listen. I know we've got some loyal followers out there. We do this as a labor of love, but we're we're happy that there are people that enjoy it as hopefully as much as we do. Thank you very much. <laughs>